My name is Mervat. Welcome to Troy Campus. It's so good to have you here with us wherever you're watching from, whether you're at home or you're even watching on Tuesday or Wednesday. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we were, we're just going to be finishing up our last week of the series today. And I just wanted to remind you, we would love to connect with you. If we have not already, join us on the Troy Facebook group um, and where we uh, connect, information, prayer requests, celebrate each other. You can find it. And always, you're welcome to reach out to us online as well. We'd love to meet you in person and help you find a next step. Um, in the meantime, this is a good opportunity to go and grab something to do communion. We're going to be celebrating communion today. So any bread, any crackers, anything like that that you have around you, juice, water, uh, we'd love to celebrate this moment together. In just a few minutes, we're going to be starting and singing. So uh, just join us as we celebrate through song. We're start Kensington Church, Kensington family, listen and welcome and welcome back. Welcome back to love. Welcome back to a smile. Welcome back to the Kensington service. Listen, um, it's Thanksgiving week and we're still really thankful. We're still choosing to rejoice. So right now I want to start this morning off. Let's stand to our feet and let's sing this song out together. Yeah. afraid clap
take a moment and thank God. Come on, you have so many reasons to rejoice, so many reasons to have a heart of gratitude. He woke you up today, gave you breath in your body, activity of your limbs. Come on, this is the day that he's made, and let us rejoice and be glad. We're going to sing this one together. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now my joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your Great way to start the day, grateful for all that God has done for us. Good morning, everyone. You guys are energetic now. You're pumped, right? After those two songs. That's awesome. Well, we can't wrap up the Thanksgiving season without celebrating Thanksgiving baskets. Who was part of Thanksgiving baskets this year? That's awesome. Yep. So Thanksgiving Baptist, for those who don't know, is part of something that we do at Kensington all together as a Kensington movement. Six campuses, 28 years of doing this. This is our tradition. And we uh, donate, we pack baskets, we deliver them. And this year we were able to raise, hear this, almost $60,000 to make 1,400 baskets impacting 8,000 people. Yep. 
That's what you were able to do as a community. So what was really neat is the numbers are great, but the stories are even better. Uh, one teacher in Pontiac shared that one of her students came up Monday so excited because it was the first time he'd had a Thanksgiving ba uh, dinner at all. Because uh, for most families, they have to choose between a meal all week or Thanksgiving dinner, which is one night a week. And that, that small basket allowed him to half a meal. And another, uh, one of the families that delivered a woman, she was uh, a little bit disappointed because as she delivered the basket, they prayed outside, she realized that people were watching inside from the windows, peeking through, but they didn't open the door. And she was a little discouraged until her daughter reminded her that the family must have been really embarrassed to open the door and receive a handout, right? but they were smiling from the window because they were prayed over. So just remember the impact that we have. We might not fully see it, but we know that we're impacting lives. And uh, if you haven't participated, definitely do it next year, it's a tradition. Um, the next Kesing tradition that we wanna share about is our Christmas midweek, which is definitely, uh, at least for the last four years, has been a way for this community to prepare our hearts for Christmas through worship and song. And it'll be on December 14th on Wednesday night. This year it's gonna be extra special because we are combining a live nativity, so you can come between 5.30 and 6.30. We'll have dinner, a live nativity outside. I think there's animals involved. And uh, at 6.30, we'll be in the auditorium. We're returning to the auditorium because we won't all fit in the chapel. So it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be a lot of music. It's going to be a family-friendly event. So bring somebody with you and come, and we'll celebrate then. So in just a minute, we are going to also show you a story of impact. We've been showing you these stories of impact uh, for the last few weeks. And this one is really special because not only does it show us the impact that we are having together, but it's also an impact that is not only temporary like right now, but it's also for generations to come. So in the meantime, while they're putting that on, stand up and tell somebody around you what was your favorite Thanksgiving side. look at inner city schools, they're usually lacking in adequate reading materials. They don't even have books. We always find ourselves always trying to get the same level or quality of education as the suburban schools. And so when you look at opportunities in places like Flint, Michigan, or Pontiac, when you don't see anything different, you just feel like you just sucked into the world that's around you. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Parents were teenagers when they had me. We lived in, you know, inner city neighborhoods, getting kicked out of houses and getting kicked out of apartments and just having that instability of, of where we're gonna live and how we're gonna get around. I remember we finally got one, like, real car and it got repossessed in, like, less than six months because they couldn't afford the payments. Ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to be a doctor. Went off to college and I started my career path to pursue medicine. I took a class called Careers in Health my senior year, and that's when I found out about like physician assistant, nurse practitioner, and I was like, oh, I can go that route, <laughs> you know? So I went that route. Um, so I graduated with my pre-med degree and then went to Wayne State. They had a second career, second degree program. So then I did that. Um, I was only supposed to work one year as a nurse, but my husband wanted to get his master's first. So after he finished and I went back to grad school and got my degree for adult primary care nurse practitioner. So about 10 years ago, I started another uh, program called GEO. We went around to local inner city high schools and we recruited high school students and we took them on college ex excursions, I call it. But I remember during that time, I went up to Pontiac High School and I took them a flyer. I remember they looked at it and it was like, mm, our kids, you know, 
they they wouldn't be interested in this. And I was just like, wow, you didn't even ask them, but okay, <laughs> you know. So it was that. So I thought that was kind of weird. And so I started doing some research, and I just noticed that with Pontiac High School, with the proficiency scores in regards to math and reading, it was terrible. Like it was like zero percent were proficient in math, and like less than ten percent were proficient in reading. And so now I'm going back to that little girl, Tamika, you know, who was in the inner city, and knowing that education was one of the main things that can get us out and, and transform our narrative and our future generations to come. And so I was like, wow, I reached out to school partners at Kensington. And I was like, Julie, what about the high school? Like, are we doing anything in the high school? And she said, Tamika, why don't you just go start something at the high school? I said, sign me up. Sounds like a winner. Ma'am, I need your pencil. Why? I need your pencil. Why? I need your pencil. Why? I like the dialogue. <laughs> I found out he got a brother. I need a pencil. Okay, well then we might. So Imagine is an after school program at Pontiac High School, and our vision is to bring an end to generational poverty. And our mission on how we do that, we transform the way the students view themselves, the way they view education, and the way they view the world around them. So what a typical day looks like. We meet on Mondays after school from 2.30 to 5 p.m. We feed them, and then usually at 2.45, we actually start the tutoring time and we do math drills to build up those muscles. And then I am statements is just, you know, we believe the power of life and death is in the tongue. So it's getting them to speak different, to, to believe something different. So they say things like, I am created to do good. I am brilliant. I am amazing. You know, I am loved. I am accepted. I am made in the image and likeness of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am brilliant. I am created to do good. I am accepted. I am loved. I am destined for me. And then we get into our large group. This past week, we talked about identity, talked about the power of education. So don't let whatever your circumstances are hold you back, make you feel like you can't do it, make you feel like it's not worth it, make you feel like it's too hard because that's not the case. But it's just great to, to see them come alive. I mean, these students are coming alive. So Faith is a young lady. She was a senior last year. I said, Faith, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she was just like, well, I want to be a nurse. I said, well, you should do it. And she's like, have you seen my grades? She's like, nah, I'm not going to be able to do it. When I started high school, you need 22 credits to graduate from Pontiac High. I had 12 and a half. So I had to make up 10 credits by May not only did I have to make up 10 credits, I had to, I had to keep up with my core classes as well. So my head, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna graduate. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna graduate. But then you had Tamika like, Nurse Faith, you got it. You had Wendy like, you're so smart, you got it. And eventually she just started, I mean, just started like believing like nothing's impossible. She got to the end, she was like, Miss Tamika, I'm, I'm not gonna stop at my bachelor's degree. I'm gonna go and get my PhD. I'm gonna be just like you. I'm gonna have my own practice. I'm gonna do this, this and that. And I was like, let's do it. <laughs> I was like, come on. All year, I'm like, I'm missing this amount of credits. I'm, I'm not ready yet. I'm not there. My grades are already bad. So when the lady called me into the office and was like, here's your cap and gown, I'm like, wait, like what? Like. Here's my what, huh? Like, she gave it to me. All I could do was sit there and I almost cried in her face. Like, I'm like, I really did it. And the first person I called, Tamika. Tamika was so happy. Oh my God, Nurse Faith, you did it. Like, <laughs> like I was, that made me feel good. Cause I'm like, they helped me. Now they proud of me. So I have to make, make sure that they continue to be proud of me. Cause Tamika believed in me when nobody else did. It was Nurse Faith all year, all year. And she still don't stop calling me that, so I like that. We went to Oakland University for a tour, and the lady at Oakland University, the connection there, she really gravitated towards Faith, because Faith was just asking a lot of questions. She was really interested. And so she the one told Faith about Jackson Community College, because Jackson Community College, they have dorms and all this type of stuff. She can still have that college feel, but be able to bring her grades up. I applied in July, and I found out maybe a couple of a couple of days after I applied and I was like whoa <laughs> like cuz my whole thing was I wanted to go away cuz like if I go home I'm gonna get the fan at home and not want to do what I'm supposed to do but I'm like okay now that I'm not at home I'm an hour and a half away I can't just get up and go home I can't quit even if I wanted to so it pushes me to just keep going I, I don't have a choice hey, hey. how you doing uh, I'm here <laughs> 
I'm going to get my associates in nursing here. I know. What's going on? And then I want to move to Texas and go to Texas Southern to get my bachelor's and my master's in nursing. The fact that I even got here from, from high school is amazing. The Bible says with God, you know, nothing's impossible, right? And that's just what I believe. I just believe that if the right person is in your place, and around you, then it can bring different things out of you that, that had you been alone and isolated, couldn't. I am loved and I am destined for greatness. I am artistic, I am fun, and I am well-mannered. These futures are gonna be changed forever. Their generations are gonna be changed forever. I am successful. I am brilliant and I am accepted. And just having that type of community around you can be one that not only nurtures you, but also cause you to grow and to blossom and to sprout like never before. I am loved and appreciated by my friends and family. I know that I am fearless. <laughs> then after college, I was gonna go to the military, do my four years in the Navy, and live a happy, li happy life after that. And they speak up to the prophecy True, true, true. <laughs> Tamika's story is overwhelming because she had a vision and she stepped out in courage to share that vision with the next generation and to see the impact in Faith's life and many more. As she spoke words of life and identity. It's just so powerful to consider how Tamika's story is just one of many stories happening around Kensington. And that really is what our Move Out Network is. It's these opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our local communities. And it is such a privilege just to see the different ways that people are moving beyond the four walls of the church to be able to bring the love and the hope of Jesus to our local communities. So as you consider a year-end Christmas gift to Kensington, I wanna say thank you. You are a part of Tamika's story and many other stories of impact throughout our community. And we're so glad that you consider us a place that you wanna partner with. Now, Shauna, quick question. Is it a real Christmas tree or a fake Christmas oh, tree? Oh, there is only one answer and that is real, 100%. I agree. We just picked up ours and cannot wait to celebrate this next season. Yes, and we hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Merry Christmas. Such an inspiring story as to what God is doing in and through this community just to impact the lives of others. But I do have to say one thing. I totally disagree with them because you know what? I'm all about the artificial Christmas tree. Honestly, the more fake it is, the better. You can boo. You can boo. All of you real tree people still, we will accept you. We will love you. May, may even like help you clean up all the needles underneath the tree and drag that tree out to the curb when Christmas is finally over. But hey, something else that I want to mention, something else that we have to be grateful for, and I actually missed this, I can't believe I missed this in the first service, is that we also want to be able to celebrate Michigan's big win yesterday, do we not? Yes. Yes, to all of you who didn't cheer, I guess you guys are all Buckeyes fans, but who knows, maybe not. But anyways, amazing victory, so glad for that as well. Just another thing that we can celebrate today. But hey, when I watch that video and videos like this, I love these year-end giving videos, but especially this video, and it was probably the same for many of you, there are conflicting emotions that arise in me. Because first of all, there's this incredible sense of gratitude that I leave with. Gratitude for what God is doing through incredible leaders like Tamika and our school partners program of how she is impacting the lives of the next generation. And understanding that it doesn't just end with that generation, but it continues on through the generation after that and after that and after that. And it is passed on in such an incredible ways. But at the same time, I also feel a sense of heartbreak because understanding that Pontiac High School, it's not in another country. It's not in another state. It's not in a different region of Michigan, but it is 12 miles away from where we are right now. And looking at the most recent statistics this past week, I saw that, realized, I didn't realize this, that Pontiac High School, the math proficiency is at 6% among the students, reading proficiency at 16%. And when you actually think about that, that's an extraordinary injustice, that that is happening right here. And you compare that to Troy High, and math proficiency at Troy High is at 77%. 
reading proficiency at 85%. But this is also the good news, is that because of your generosity, we as a community, through leaders like Tamika and so many others as well, we have the privilege and the opportunity to come, al to come under, to come alongside of, and really to be able to support the staff and students at various schools in our area, including at Pontiac High. And so as we come to the end of another year, and as we're thinking about all the different organizations to give a year-end gift to, we want to ask that you would consider Kensington as well. Because when we give to Kensington, and because of your generosity, it allows us to reach more and more people every single year with the hope, the love, and the transformative power of Jesus. But along the lines of schools and talking about schools, something else that I want to recognize and acknowledge is that this coming Wednesday is the one-year anniversary of the Oxford High School shooting. And it's been an incredible difficult year, incredibly difficult year for that community. And something that, that the leaders in that community have asked us to do is to not organize any formal gatherings. And so, of course, we will be honoring their request. And something that is being organized, though, is an effort to place luminaries out on our front lawns. And this is really symbolic of the fact that even in the midst of such a dark event, that the light continues to shine in that community. And so if you would like to be a part of this, you can pick up your free luminaries at the Resiliency Center in Oxford, or it's not that difficult to make our own. And so we can make our own and place it out on our front lawns as a sign of solidarity, as a sign of recognition that we stand with you, that we see you, and that you are not alone. But at the same time, something that we will continue to do as a community, as we've been doing all this past year, is we will continue to reach out, we will continue to serve, we will continue to pray for those in the Oxford community as well. And something that I want to challenge all of us to do is also to do that for one another as well, understanding that there are so many people in this Troy community who are impacted significantly by that event as well. And so today, what we want to do is we want to just take a few moments and to pray, and to pray not only for those in the Oxford community, but also for those in the Colorado Springs community and those in Chesapeake, Virginia as well, who experienced such extraordinary tragedy this past week as well. So would you bow your heads with me? So Lord, as your people, we come to you today, Lord, and we are grateful that your promise is, is that when your people are hurting, that you're not a distant God that you're not someone who cannot be found, but you truly are near. And that is who you are, Lord. And so, Lord, as we come to the one-year anniversary of what happened in Oxford, Lord, we continue to pray, Lord, for the people in that community, especially, Lord, for the loved ones of those who were injured, for those who were killed. And I pray, Lord, that this week, Lord, that they would sense your presence in a truly powerful and tangible way. Thank you, Lord. And so often how you reveal your presence, Lord, is through the people around us. And so, Lord, I pray that they would just really be surrounded by people who just are able to cry with them, who are able to encourage them, who are able to pray for them and just simply be the tangible expression of your presence in their lives, Lord. And Lord, we pray that as so many people in that community are continuing to mourn and grieve, Lord, and heal, God, that that process would continue to unfold and your comfort, your peace that you promise us, Lord, and that you tell us surpasses all understanding, Lord, would be tangibly felt as well. And we also pray for the community in Colorado Springs, Lord, and also in Chesapeake, Virginia, Lord, as they are wrestling, Lord, with heartbreak and just deep, deep sorrow and grief, Lord. And I pray that today, Lord, that they would just sense you with them, Lord. And also as your followers, Lord, I pray that it seems like these kinds of things are in the news, Lord, and we come and we learn about them almost every single week, Lord, and they happen so often. And so show us as your people, Lord, how you desire to step into these situations, Lord, and how you desire for us to be your light in this world, which seems so dark at times. And show us how to do that, Lord. Give us the courage to do that as well. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege to be able to follow you. Thank you that you lead us even in the midst of these types of situations. Thank you, Lord. And we pray all these things in your son's powerful name. Amen.
And so today we are in the fourth and final week of our series, Table Talks. And as I was thinking about today, I was reminded, and something that came to mind just as a story was um, a place that I was in two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, I was in California and I was a part of leading an Asian American civil rights tour. And this is the third time I've had the privilege of leading this trip. And every single time it's impactful, not only for me, but for the people who are on this trip as well. And we visit a lot of different sites in California and we have have the privilege of talking to a lot of different people. And one of the places that we go is a place called Manzanar, which was one of the sites of the Japanese concentration camps during World War II. And it held almost 10,000 of the nearly 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during that war. But another place that we go to is called Angel Island in San Francisco. And sometimes Angel Island is referred to as the Ellis Island of the West. But I don't believe that that's true because it's a very, very different place. Because those people who were coming to Angel Island, they were, they were welcomed by the Statue of Liberty. And they were released about two to three hours after they arrived. But Angel Island, not so much. Because the objective on Angel Island was not primarily inclusion, but exclusion. And this exclusion primarily happened to Chinese immigrants. And when you actually, and the people who came to Angel Island, and you see some of these images, and you see the toilets, and you see some of the facilities of where they were held. And the people who came to Angel Island, they were held on average between two weeks to six months. And some were held for even as long as two years. And it's really, really ironic when you go to Angel Island, because you have to take a ferry there, and you pass by Alcatraz, which is probably the mo one of the most famous prisons in our country. And so you pass by Alcatraz and you just go basically to another prison, which is also known as an immigration center. And when you actually walk through the detention facility, one of the things that is so striking about this facility is that there are poems etched into the walls of this detention center. And one of the stories that really struck me was of a 13-year-old boy and he etched and he carved his poem into the wall while he was lying on his bed, looking out at San Francisco, hoping that one day he would be able to enter into this country. And his poem, if you actually, and there's a translation of it, like so many of the other poems, they express fear and frustration, but also hope. Hope that one day that he would be allowed into this land of opportunity. And one of the people who came with me on this trip um, is a friend of mine. And he told me towards the end of our week together that one of the reasons why he came was because he wanted to know why all of this Asian American stuff, why all of this Asian American history and issues of identity and justice, why I was so passionate about it, why it was so important to me. And it reminded me of the words of a friend, another friend of mine who said to me years ago, the problem with the Asian American experience is that no one cares about the Asian American experience, including Asian Americans. Because the myth about Asian Americans is that we all go to Ivy League schools, that we're all going to Harvard and Yale, and then we make just six figures. But it's a myth, it's a stereotype. And there's actually a term for it because it's so incredibly harmful to the Asian American community. And it's actually called the model minority theory. And when you actually read about it, you will understand why it is so hurtful, why it is so damaging to this community and to this population in our nation. And so as I was talking to this friend of mine towards the end of the week, he told me that, hey, this is the reason why he came. And then he said to me after experiencing everything that he had, now I understand. Now I understand why you feel this way. And, why God, and what God did in his life during that week was that he unlocked things in my friend. And he opened his eyes to a new and deeper reality, not only about who he is, but also the world around him as well. And today, as we're gonna see in the final week of our series, in this series called Table Talks, this is also what Jesus did. Because in this series, we've been looking at the different tables that Jesus sat at. And today, we are going to be looking at the Passover table. And at the Passover table is where Jesus would have his final meal, his last supper with his disciples before he went to the cross. And it was at this final meal, at this table, at this last supper, that Jesus would reveal a new and deeper meaning to his followers, not only about who he was, but also what he came to do. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to be picking up the story in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. And when we pick up the story, what we find out is, is that Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem. And he was in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival, which is a week-long festival. And Jerusalem, which at this time typically had a population of about 30,000, it would have swelled to almost 200,000 for this event, for this week. And that meant that the people in the surrounding regions would have flooded into the city to take part in Passover. And so this is what Matthew tells us was happening. And he writes this. And he says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, which is another name for the Passover festival, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And so Jesus replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And so what we see is, and what we just read, is that it's the first day of the Passover festival. And Jesus is getting ready with his disciples, preparing to eat this all-important meal. But in order to truly understand what Passover is, we sort of have to rewind the story a little bit. And we have to go back and we really have to look at the origins of this meal and festival. And so when we go back to the second book in the Bible, which is also known as the book of Exodus, we see that the Israelites were slaves. And they were slaves in Egypt and had been slaves for centuries. And in their pain, in their oppression, in their suffering, they cried out to God for help. They, they cried out to God saying, save us, God. Would you please help us? Are you listening? And it tells us in the scriptures, in the book of Exodus, that God heard their cries and he sent a man named Moses to rescue them. And if you've read the story in the Bible, if you've seen the movie, The Prince of Egypt, if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you understand what happened, right? Because Moses goes into Pharaoh, who was the most powerful human being in the world at the time, and he said, and I picture it sort of like Charlton Heston in his deep Charlton Heston voice, right? Him saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. Right? And he asked him to release his people. But Pharaoh, he basically says, and I'm paraphrasing here, and he basically says to Moses, yeah, no. That's not going to happen. And so what then God did was that he sent plague after plague upon the nation of Egypt. But every single time, Pharaoh said no. And so after nine plagues, nine times of Pharaoh saying no, finally, God said to Moses, I'm going to send one more plague. And this time, Pharaoh's going to release my people. But he also told Moses to tell his people, make sure that they're ready to go because they are going to have to leave quickly. And so what this meant was that for the people of God, they had to pack light. We're talking, this is not a check to baggage event. This was like carry on only people because they had to leave. But what God also told his people was that they were to prepare and eat one final meal on their final night in Egypt. And at this meal, what they were to do is that they were to slaughter a lamb and that they were to take some of its blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of their homes. And then they were to take the meat and they were to roast it and eat it quickly. And then they were to take some dough, which didn't have any yeast in it because they didn't have time to allow it to rise. And they were to bake it and to eat it quickly. And this is why this festival is also called the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And it was on that night that the, that the angel of death went through the entire nation of Egypt. And on those houses that had blood on the door frames, the angel passed over those homes, which is why we call it Passover and the children inside were spared. But those homes, the Egyptian homes that didn't have the blood on the door frames, the firstborn son inside was killed. And this included Pharaoh's firstborn son. And when Pharaoh discovered what had happened, he called Moses in immediately and he told him, get out, get out, take all your people and leave. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. And so after more than four centuries of being slaves, the Israelites were now finally free. And afterwards, God gave his people a very, very important command. And this is what he said to his people. He said, remember, remember, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, the Lord, it wasn't you, but I'm the one who brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. And then he continues on in the book of Exodus. This is the day to remember. Each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. And so what God is saying to his people, he says, remember, 
Don't forget what I have done for you. His command was never, ever forget. And so what God commanded his people to do was that every year on that day, they were to prepare and eat the same meal that their ancestors had first eaten while they were slaves in Egypt. And this meal wasn't to end with them, but they were to pass this meal down to their children, to their children's children, and all throughout the generations. And it wasn't because the food was amazing or because the drinks were that good, but rather because this meal told the story of what God had done for them and who they were, that they once had been slaves, but because of God's intervention, because of his love, because of his care for his people, they were now free. And just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever experienced a Passover Seder before? Anyone? Okay, so a couple of us. And so the very first time, it's this incredible experience, and really the first and only time that I've experienced this meal was more than 10 years ago at the first church I worked at in the New York, New Jersey area. And this was the ironic, this was the funny part. You had a Korean American community and a Jewish American community coming together for this meal. And it really was this beautiful picture. But the funny thing is, is they asked this guy to be the primary organizer, right? I had no idea what I was doing, right? So I had to do all of this research, but I'm so incredibly grateful that there were other people who actually knew what they were doing because it, it, it requires, to, in order to pull this off, it requires a ton of organization, a lot of preparation and planning and a lot of intentionality. But it is truly a powerful, powerful experience because this meal doesn't take 15 minutes or 30 minutes to eat, but rather it's an entire evening. And the story of God unfolds as you continue throughout. And every aspect of this meal tells tells the story of who God is and what he did for his people. And so if you ever have an opportunity to take part in this, it really is such a beautiful and just really powerful experience. And I left that meal just feeling this profound sense of gratitude of who God is and what he has done on behalf of his people. And so this meal, this Passover meal, that the Israelites had first experienced and taken part in when they were slaves in Egypt, this was the meal that years later, centuries later, that Jesus and his disciples were preparing to eat. And it would be Jesus' last meal before he would go to the cross and be killed. And so this is the question that we have to ask. Why in the world would Jesus choose this meal as his last one? Right? He could have chosen any meal. There were lots of other meals on the Jewish calendar which were very, very significant. So why choose this one? And he did so for a very, very important reason. Because going back to the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament, what this meal signaled, what it signified was that it signaled the beginning of a new era. It signaled the beginning of something new. Because before this meal, the identity of the Israelites was that of slaves. But after this meal, there would be a major move of God where every Egyptian firstborn son would be killed. And as a result, God delivered his people from slavery. And when this happened, the Israelites also experienced a change in their identity in that they went from, from being slaves to now being free. And in a similar manner, the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples, it also signaled the beginning of something new. But it was something new, not just for the people of Israel, but for all of humanity. Because before this meal, our identity as human beings was that of slaves, slaves to sin and death. But after this meal, there would be another major move of God, where another, first, where another firstborn son would be killed. And he wouldn't be just any firstborn son. He would be the son of God, the savior of the world, who would voluntarily give his life for the sins of humanity, for your sins and for mine. And because of what he did, that we, those of us who have chosen to commit to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that we have been delivered from sin and death. We have been granted our freedom and that we have gone through a change in our identity in going from slaves to now being free. And this is the extraordinary thing about this meal and what Jesus did. And in the Gospel of Matthew, what we actually see is that Jesus transformed the Passover meal into what we now call communion today. And these are his words. And it says, Matthew tells us, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so just as the Jewish people throughout their history have eaten this meal as a way of remembering and celebrating the freedom as well as the new identity that God has given them, when we come to the communion table, what we are doing is that we are remembering and celebrating the freedom and the new identity that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. That is the significance of this table. And later on today, we're actually going to be taking part in communion and reminds us of this, of this story. And this is the significance of this table. But at the same time, something else, then when we talk about this whole idea of new identity, another way that we proclaim and we declare this new identity that we have in Jesus is through baptism. And if you were here last Sunday or if you were watching on stream, you saw that there were more than 20 people in this community who took that step to be baptized. And it was beautiful. And you're going to see some pictures right now. And some of these people already registered and other people, when it was 20 degrees outside, they felt that nudge of God saying, hey, you know what? Today is your day. And they went into that water as well, even though it was cold outside. And these stories, if I wish every single one of these people could have shared their stories because we would have just been absolutely blown away as to how God has worked in every single one of these people's lives. The fingerprints, his fingerprints just all over them. And this would not be able to happen without your generosity because your generosity truly allows us as a community collectively to take this message of Jesus out further and further and further and truly to the ends of the world. And when I even think about this past year, about what God has been able to do through all of us, I really am blown away, not just in places like Pontiac High and in this area, but in countries and amongst people thousands of miles away. So I am so incredibly grateful for your generosity. And so what we want to do right now is we want to just take a moment in our service and receive our offering for today. And so ushers, if you want to come down for that. And so the offering bags are going to be coming around and that is one way that we can give. But I recognize that for the majority of us here in this room and watching on stream, we give electronically. And so if you would like to give electronically, there are a number of ways you can scan the QR code on the screen there. We can also text the word Kensington to 77977. We can give via the app or we can give via the website. But ultimately, what I want to say is thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for your open-handedness. And so going back to the story, this is the thing, right? God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. But when you actually think about it, that was the easy part because the most difficult part wasn't getting the Israelites out of Egypt. It was getting Egypt out of them. Because even though God had physically delivered his people from slavery, in the years and the decades to come, they failed to fully grasp their new identity as free people of God. And every single time, what they would do is over and over again, they would go back to wanting to be in slavery and bondage. And we see this because after they left Egypt, they found themselves wandering around in the wilderness for 40 long years. And whenever they encountered difficulty, they would, they would almost always whine and complain to God saying, we want to go back to Egypt because at least in Egypt, we had water to drink and food to eat. And you read this and you're like, are you crazy? Right, like you guys are nuts. Right? How can you remember that? That's what you remember about Egypt? That you had water to drink and food to eat? You don't remember the beatings? You don't remember how you suffered all the pain? How you had to work nonstop? That's what you remember? And it's this selective memory, this selective amnesia. And I feel like it happens to all of us. And it happens to my kids almost every single summer. Because every summer over the 4th of July, we go on a road trip to visit my in-laws in Minnesota. And in addition, the whole trip... All the stops, the driving, everything all in takes us 19 hours. And we don't stop to sleep anywhere. This is just a one-shot deal. We go, right? And my kids are amazing. But towards the last handful of hours, they start melting down and they start falling apart. And they start saying nonsensical things. Like with two hours left, someone inevitably says, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I just want to go home. Let's just go home. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like 17 hours that way and two hours that way. And you have experienced what happens when we go to grandma and papa's, right? There's food, there's freedom, there's cousins, grandparents, water, all of this. But they forget and they forget and you and I forget, and the Israelites forgot as well. Because this is the extraordinary thing that God had given the Israelites. He said, here is freedom. 
Here is your new identity. But over and over and over again, they said, you know what? I actually prefer bondage and slavery. And I'm actually going to go back. And again, you and I are no different. Because what Jesus did, when we say yes to following Jesus, what he does is that he takes the chains off of us. And that we are no longer slaves to sin and death. But so often what we do is we go back to that old life, to those old patterns of behavior. And we're like, you know what? I don't really like my freedom. Maybe I'll just go back and just put these chains back on. And we are no different. And so this is the thing. This is why God commanded his people to remember. He said, do not forget. And this is why he told them every single year to observe the Passover meal because it would allow his people to do two things. First of all, it would allow them to remember the story to remember the story of what God had done for them and who they were. And if you ever experience a Passover Seder, you will realize that every aspect of this meal is intentional. From the food, the drinks, the songs that are sung, the readings that are done, from the conversations, everything tells a story. And the purpose is to remind us of those two things, of who we are and what God has done for us. And in a similar way that when we come to the table, the communion table, as we're, being, as we're going to be doing later today, is that that's exactly what happens as well, that we remember the story. We remember the story of God in our lives, what Jesus has done for us on the cross and how his, his body is, was broken for us, which, cel- which symbolizes the bread and his blood that was spilled for us, which symbolizes the juice. We're reminded of this story and who we are in him. But this is what I really do passionately believe is that it can't just be occasionally, that once in a while that we are reminded of this, but we need daily and regularly to be reminded, which is why I so deeply believe it's absolutely essential for us to to read, listen, interact, engage, whatever it may be for you with the scriptures every single day. Because what the scriptures do is that they tell us the story of God, his passion, his love, and his unending pursuit of us. And so I know that probably for many of us, we have a copy of the scriptures in our home, wherever we may have it. But at the same time, many times, if you're anything like me, that I'm not necessarily in that room where my Bible is. And so one of the things that I found so incredibly helpful is to have a Bible app on my phone. And if you don't already have this Bible app, I would highly recommend downloading the YouVersion Bible app. It really is. It's the most downloaded Bible app in the world. But at the same time, something else that I want to mention is that this Bible app has so many resources, But what Corey Hendrickson, who's our discipleship director, what he has also done is that he has created a Kensington Church profile on this app. And so specifically for us as a community. And so if you scan that QR code, you will go to that profile. And there are a lot of different resources that are really Kensington specific. And they're going to be reading plans, Bible studies, different ways, devotionals, different ways to engage with the scriptures. And so if you want to just take a picture or if you just want to scan it right now, you will go directly to that. But this is one way that we are able to remember the story of God in our life, which is so incredibly important. But at the same time, not only for us to remember the story, but I believe it's essential that we also remember in community and that we need others to remind us of this, of who we are, and again, what God has done for us. And this is why when God commanded his people, I want you to observe the Passover. (laughs) It's the reason why this meal isn't you just go and you just sit off in a corner by yourself, but rather it's a meal that is shared amongst a community with family and other families and all of these people coming together to remember together because there is power in community. And when it comes to communion, there's no explicit command in the scriptures where God tells us, hey, you have to do this with other people. But so often we find ourselves in these types of settings that when we take communion, it's not by ourselves, but rather it's together because there is power when we come together. There is a sense of unity when we brush, when we, when we rub shoulders with one another. And when we actually do this, not by ourselves, but rather together as a community. And so, because we need these people around us, because God hasn't designed us to do life alone, but rather with other people, other people who can encourage us, challenge us, pray for us, and remind us and reflect the story of God to us, who he is and who we have been created to be as well. 
And so this is my challenge for us. And I've given this challenge before, but this is my challenge also to us today, that if we do not have these people in our life, these people who we can have conversations about life and God with, what would it look like for us to take that step this week? And a step that you can tangibly take today here in this community is to jump into a small group. And if you want to tr try out a small group, if you want to check out the small groups that we have and you're here in this room, I would encourage you, go out to the hub. You'll see people with bright orange shirts on and they would love to be able to help you with that. Or you can go to the website, which is kensingtonchurch.org forward slash groups. But this is the thing, that in order to jump into a group, it takes courage and it takes humility. And the first group that you go and check out, that you jump into, you may not find your people. And so you may have to go to another group and check out that group or maybe another group as well. But if you persevere, if you endure, I promise you, because that is the story of so many people, and that is my story as well, that you will find your people and that you will not have to do life alone. So what would it look like for us to take that step and not remember by ourselves, but be, rem be reminded in community with other people? And last week at our Birmingham campus, a man by the name of Hutan was baptized. And Hutan is somebody who for decades of his life was skeptical and disinterested in, Christian, in the Christian faith, partly because of his parents' beliefs, but also because of the way that he saw the church in world history and how he saw people who claimed to be Jesus followers leverage Jesus for their own personal gain, for their own personal wealth, fame, and success. And so he basically said for decades, I want to have nothing to do with Jesus because this is the model, this is the reflection of Jesus I see in all of these people throughout history. But what happened to him this year was that he had a midlife crisis. And he, one of the things with his midlife crisis is that he wanted a motorcycle. And not just any motorcycle, he wanted a Ducati. And so he went up to his wife one day and he said, can I have a motorcycle? And his wife, who is a Jesus follower, said, absolutely not. Not because she follows Jesus, but for other reasons. And so one of the things was that he wasn't going to let this go. And so he just kept on coming and coming and coming. And he was, gonna, he was willing to do anything. He basically said to her, you know what? I'll go to church with you. I'll join a men's group. I'll do whatever it takes. So his wife, she wasn't messing around. And I don't know if she's an attorney, but she actually created a contract for him to sign, which basically said that if you want this bike, this is what you had to do. And it included attending a men's group regularly. It also said that he would promise to never ride his bike without protective equipment. And it also included him going to man camp, which is our annual men's retreat back in October. And so he didn't know that he was going to do this, but in October, he found himself in a car with a bunch of other guys from our Birmingham campus going up to man camp. And it was that weekend that he had these incredible conversations with those guys in his car about faith and about who Jesus is. And these guys prayed for him. And he also entered into these environments where he was able to worship with all hundreds of other guys, worship God together. And he encountered the God of the universe, the savior of the world. And what we're talking about today, this freedom, this new identity that Jesus invites us into, that invitation that he extends to us, that he said yes to that invitation and he had his life transformed. And I truly believe that when we actually say yes to Jesus, it's not just our life that has changed, but it's also the people around us as well and the generations to come. And this is a picture of Hutan getting baptized at Birmingham. And this is the beautiful thing about it. You see those guys around that tub? Those are the guys that he met at man camp. And those are the guys that he meets with on a weekly basis. They're the guys in his men's group. And these are the guys, they come together and they study the scriptures. They talk about life very deeply. They share very, very openly. They pray for one another. During the week, they text one another. And it's with these guys that he is able to be reminded of the story of God, of who he is and the freedom that he has in Christ. But at the same time, he's also reminded of this in community, which is so incredibly powerful, exactly what we've been talking about today. And so what we're gonna do right now is that we are going to be coming to the communion table and that there are gonna be four stations up here. 
And that when we actually come to the table again, we are reminded together. We have the privilege of being reminded together today of the story of God and who we are. That when we actually take this bread, it represents the broken body of Jesus. When we drink the juice, it represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us, his sacrifice so that we could be free. And so this is what we are going to do today. So I'm gonna pray. And then I wanna invite you to come. And as I mentioned, there are gonna be four stations, but many times the two furthest stations do not get much love. And so if you wanna go out to the furthest stations, I would highly encourage you to do that. But as we come to the communion table today, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that as your people, Lord, that we thank you for your love. Thank you for your care for us, Lord. Thank you for your pursuit of us, that you never, ever give up on us, God. Even when we turn our back on you, Lord, and we go back, Lord, to choosing slavery and bondage and putting on those old chains, Lord, you keep on coming. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And so as we come to the table today, Lord, I pray that we would be reminded once again of who you are, that you are the God of the universe, Lord, who has set us free. And that is who we are, Lord. And so for those of us, Lord, who may have just that we are in bondage, that we have addictions and old habits, Lord, that we cannot seem to get free from, Lord. Show us the step that we can take today to realize the freedom that you purchased for us on the cross. And so often, Lord, we can't do it by ourselves, and which is why you have placed people around us and show us also how we can take a step into community today. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful community that's not just in this room, but also on stream as well. We are grateful, Lord, that we can be together. And we pray all these things in your son's powerful name. Amen. So I wanna invite you whenever you are ready, please feel free to come down and let's come to the table together. But who do you say I am? Some say a prophet. Some say a priest come back to life. You keep asking. But who do you say I am? The Christ, the King, the living, breathing God, the Messiah God with us, how great the revelation to see you as you are, the Christ, the King, exalted over all. I've seen healing, I've seen dead things raised to life, I've been a witness. Too many things I can't deny I've seen your wounded side The scars upon your hands You keep asking But who do you say I am? The Christ, the King The living, breathing God The light, the way Messiah God with us
That song is really the perfect song for us to end with because it talks exactly about what we've been looking at today. And it just takes us through the whole history of God's story and how we come to today as to who we are. 
And so that we, as we leave today and as we go into a brand new week, that we would leave with that knowledge and that we would be reminded daily of God's work in our life and our new, new identity as a result. And so thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you so much for streaming and have a great, great rest of your Thanksgiving Sunday.